Hello, I'm Giles Wittell. Uh, we're recording this episode in front of an audience, a live audience in the Tortoise Newsroom. Welcome to the news meeting. The results are in and Donald Trump victorious in tonight's New Hampshire primary. Well, I want to thank everybody. This is a fantastic state. Ukraine says at least five people have been killed in a wave of missile attacks overnight. Scientists say a simple blood test could revolutionize the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Smoke rises in the distance over Khan Yunis, where Israeli forces are now focusing their firepower. The Oscars nominations are now out. Barbie Outrage, the biggest grossing film of 2023, just got snubbed big time. So what should lead the news? This is personal for me because uh, in my day job, I've already tried to decide that today and in advance for tomorrow. But anyway, for the purposes of this podcast, that's what the four of us on this stage and everyone in the newsroom here are going to try and work out. Joining me are my tortoise colleagues, Jess Winch and Stephen Armstrong. Hello. 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 And we're also very pleased to have with us the journalist and academic Jane Martinson. Jane recently reported an episode of Tortoise's Slow Newscast. It's called Mr. Wright, Paul Marshall and the Battle for the Telegraph. And she knows whereof she speaks because she's also the author of a book in similar territory, You May Never See Us Again, which it says here is about the current Telegraph owners, David and Frederick Barclay, but only one of them is still alive, right? Indeed. Which Frederick. one? Frederick. Um, David died, sadly, at the, uh, the almost year after COVID, of COVID. David died? Yes. Frederick's still alive. OK, so you've each chosen a story you think should lead the news and you're going to explain why. We'll discuss them and then at the end I'll decide which ones Tortoise should cover, more than we have already, and in what order. So let's start with long stories short in a single sentence or phrase or haiku, or whatever you like. Jess, what's your story? <clears throat> it's happening, the rematch nobody wants. OK. I wanted a, I think we know what that's I feel that's I should about. have done a haiku now. It's just... <laughs> well, I, I toyed with a, with a pun on this uh, this morning Which was? for a headline, something to do with Haley's Comet, but of course, inappropriate in the circumstances. Um, <laughs> Stephen. Uh, Dad's Army, the Gen Z version. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Can we go further? Or uh, <laughs> Spad's army? I don't know. <laughs> Jane. So I was told you have to do, it's the first one I've done of this live news meeting, that the shorter the title, the better. So I went for the New Rebel Alliance. But if you wanted to stand first, it could be battle for the heart of the right in a galaxy close to home. <laughs> Very nice. OK, so who are we going to start with? Jess, why don't you tell us about your story and why you think it matters? So this is the story that most people have probably seen this morning, that Trump won in New Hampshire last night after very emphatically also winning in Iowa last week. And I'm pitching it not because the result is a surprise. We knew that Trump was likely to win in New Hampshire. But I feel that something has shifted this week that's quite important to note, and that is that for a year or so, we have seen poll after poll, pundit after pundit, warn that Trump is going to be the Republican presidential nominee for 2024. And I feel that a lot of people, probably myself included, have been a little bit fingers in their ears saying, maybe it won't happen, maybe Ron DeSantis will come through, his star starts to fade. Oh no, Licky Haley, she's gonna maybe be the one that sweeps up the moderates, sweeps up the independents. Maybe she'll manage to make this into sort of at least a two horse race until uh, the criminal charges start to come to trial, until maybe some convictions start looking imminent and then perhaps support will shift. And I think what has happened this week is that both the scale of his win in Iowa and the fact that no Republican who has won both Iowa and New Hampshire has failed to become the Republican presidential nominee has really hit home that it's happening. That we should, you know, we need to wake up to the reality. So end of the wishful thinking? A Little bit, yeah. I think there was a, a poll, an economist poll recently that said that 45% of Democrats thought that Trump would be the nominee. And I feel that number needs to get higher now and people need to start, <coughs> not just in America, but everywhere now, really <coughs> taking notice of, of what's going to happen. So the, the zero figure is compelling, zero being the number of, as you say, Republican contenders for the nomination of one Iowa and Hampshire and hadn't got, haven't got the nomination. But a few hours before the voting, 
Nikki Haley's campaign manager released a statement, which was quite interesting. It said basically, uh, whatever happens, we're carrying on, which is par for the course. They've got to do that. But there was some quite interesting stuff there. Uh, it, it ended with, as we said in the sense maker this morning, do Republicans want to win? In other words, making the case that we're going to stay in it because, by the way, Nikki Haley stands a better chance of beating Joe Biden than Trump does. She she's, she beats both of them. Right. There's a, there's a CNN poll that found that Haley was the only 2024 Republican contender who beat Biden by such a margin that it went beyond the margin of error. So on that so basis, she is the most. If this was if this election was held now, she's the most likely candidate to beat both Biden and Trump. But the reality is that we're in a two-party system where Biden and Trump are kind of locked into whatever you want to call this situation where neither one is going to back down, which means I think that, you know, uh, that Haley's campaign, while she may keep going, while it's not a done deal, while I hesitate to rule out anything at this point in a presidential race, is that it looks, it looks as though it's, it's over. But if you are one of the people who doesn't want Trump to be a candidate, um, there's another reason why you you might think that more wishful thinking is legit, and that is another point made in this in this statement from the campaign manager that just as New Hampshire was an open primary, so independents and Democrats, as long as they're not registered Democrats, could vote. So a surprising number I didn't realize this of. Uh, the next states in the pipeline, South Carolina and the Super Tuesday states, also have open or semi-open primaries. So you could get the, the, the moderates, the Indies, and some Democrats piling in to keep the, the Haley's Comet going. <laughs> I'm sorry, I feel like I'm ruining your dreams, but <laughs> Nikki Haley's trailing 37 points, percentage points behind Trump in South Carolina, which is her home state. So... Again, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm, uh, this is the week, really, that, that for me, anyway, something has, has shifted that I, I really do think it's time to, to consider Trump the, the nominee. So the story that you're... Or at least be honest about that yeah. as a realistic prospect. The story that you're pitching is not so much the result as a, a kind of meta story, which is uh, end of the wishful thinking, or as Frank Bruni put it in the New York Times this morning, the illusion is shattered. Sounds pretty yeah. much is on. Um, Stephen, what do you think? Is, is, is this a big story or was it not enough of a surprise for you to leave the news? Well, I mean, I hesitate to even raise the concept of any form of election tampering when it comes to Donald Trump. But <laughs> I, I would say that if I was a unregistered Democrat in New Hampshire, I would join this and I would vote for Donald Trump to be the candidate for the Republican Party. I mean, he, he does have a lead in the key six swing states. You know, the, the, there's only three, six places in America that yeah. decide this election. And he does have a lead there, but it's a very small lead. And if the court case goes against him, those states swing against him. So he's banking on the Supreme Court. Um, whereas Nikki Haley, if she becomes leader, she doesn't have any of those problems and she beats Joe Biden. So if I was a Democrat, I'd definitely be trying to manipulate the um, Republican primaries to make sure that Trump was the candidate, because I think he, that's who Joe Biden wants to fight. Joe Biden absolutely wants to fight Trump. We should say there are four criminal cases, 91 felony counts. Um, is there a particular one that you see going to the uh, Supreme federal Court? One, the, the federal, federal one. one, because no one beats the federal government. When, I mean, if you've got a, it, statistically, your chances of winning if you're up against the federal government are pretty slim. Right. Jane, big story? Just Oh, just I think um, the there's always a danger with Trump, isn't there, as a journalist, that we fed into this. We Every time we give, make him the lead story, we give him and everything he stands for more oxygen, uh, which he often uses against the media by saying if, if we are against him or if we say, hang on a moment, he is actually on trial for all these crimes. January the 6th, etc. Um, he then says, fake news, fake, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. They're, this is a conspiracy. And he feeds and helps, that helps his support among the base. Mm. I mean, I think it's fascinating. In a way, I sort of think Nikki Haley is the more fascinating story because, you know, as Jess has just said, she really, everything is on her side. She should win. Um, she's got this amazing backstory of sort of, you know, her, she's, uh, her partner was at armed forces for a Republican contender. She's got sort of roots in sort of Native American. You know, she's, she's sort of this brilliant candidate in many ways. And yet she seems, instead of 
even talking about those things. She's tried to be sort of mini Trump and has completely failed because no one can out Trump Trump. And that's just incredible, I think. Ron, that was Ron DeSantis' mistake, as it turned out, was trying to it's, out Trump Trump. And they've all sort of seemed so much more pathetic, and he is madder than ever. <laughs> you know, it is amazing. But that was in, what you said just then about the media feeding into, like, constantly putting Trump on the front page and just feeding the frenzy that he created. I completely agree with that, and that did happen in 2016. Um, what I think this time round, though, is that what I've seen reported is that the sort of Trump bump for news organisations just might not happen this time round because people are just tuning it out completely. That's interesting. And that I, that's why I just think there's... Well, I don't want to make Trump um, front and centre for from now until November, I think tuning it out is also a dangerous way to go. So sometimes you do have to... And it's an incredible story. Bring him up. So far, this whole discussion has been uh, based on the premise that a second Trump presidency would be a bad idea. <laughs> 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 do, you, do you really think it would be? Yes. <laughs> um, I was talking to a former US ambassador to the UN last week, and... Is that it... called name-dropping? Well, I haven't... <laughs> <laughs> sort of, but I haven't actually named him. <laughs> but where were you talking to him? Um, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not even going to say. That would be... Davos. <laughs> um, it was part of well, the day job. Yeah. He said, he, he said um, at least when it came to bracing for a second Trump presidency in the rest of the world, he said, don't make assumptions, make proposals. In other words, well, don't make assumptions, but do regard this as a biddable guy with a narrow range of specialist knowledge who, if you come to him with something that sounds muscular, constructive, on a subject that he doesn't know much, he might listen. And uh, now I will name drop. When I interviewed him uh, <laughs> a, f a few years back, he struck me very much as as a, a tabula rasa, a blank sheet, and so and I, that's that's why that sounded like like good advice. And uh, I also think that we should be. I, I think we should be wary of making assumptions about what he means for the U.S. domestically as well. Let's remember that. I shouldn't be what, blathering on like this, should I? I'm supposed to be asking, <laughs> asking the questions. But, but um, uh, it was chaos at the start of Trump 1. One thing it's not going to be at the start of Trump 2 if it happens is chaos. They've had a lot of time to plan. Project 2025. Mm. I mean, it could be catastrophic. I, I don't know. I, I'm wary of making any assumptions about it. I just, it might not be chaos in the same way as it was before, because this time they're prepared. But I think that brings with it a slightly different dynamic, which is that there will be a more um, deliberate dismantling of certain norms that we have taken for granted in the US, such as um, backing of NATO, for example, which mm. Trump has seemed to allude to that, well, maybe it might not come to help you if you need to. And that kind of language, I think, is what makes it so dangerous. And I think this plan that we've heard about, to, is, it's either two or 20,000 political appointments in federal departments, which uh, hitherto have been uh, professional civil servants. That, that could really change the complexion of the federal government, politicise it in a way that more familiar from Poland and, and Hungary and places like that. Anyway, thank you very much, Jess. Uh, Steve, what's your story and why should it leave the news? Well, picking up on what you just said about um, uh, Trump and NATO, I wanted to reference General Sir Patrick Sanders' uh, speech last night where he said it's time for Britain to uh, prepare to mobilise because he felt that we were on the brink-ish of war with Russia. He said this sort of thing before. He's talked about us a couple of years ago. We were in our 1937 moment. And he's, he's, he's basically said that we don't have the military capacity to fight Russia. Um, Rishi Sunak said, no, it's fine. We're going to be a volunteer force. And the British Army's always been a volunteer force because when it has a conscript force, there tends to be revolution and all kinds of uh, mayhem because giving British people guns is always a disaster. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I think really when... when, when you, we, I spent today talking to a lot of veterans, but a few people who are still active, about why this was said, because the British Army clearly doesn't want to have a conscript force. And they said because the British Army's in such a parlous state, the condition of the British military is so woeful that it's basically a cry to, will someone please talk about the British military and the British Army? What I'm saying is we don't have the soldiers to fight any kind of realistic war. 
the people I've been speaking to have mainly been in the Navy, and they've said, well, it's a lot worse than that in the Navy. So we technically have two aircraft carriers, but we don't have any supply or support ships or any escort ships, so we can't actually put any of them to sea, really. They're, I mean, they're both in dock at the moment, one of them in theory preparing for an exercise, but there's no support ship for it. So we have to borrow support ships from the Americans or the French or, oh, the irony, the Spanish, because um, <laughs> I don't know if anyone remembers. At the Spanish end. Armada from down yes. there. <laughs> Just after Brexit, the Spanish mooted, I think, playfully that they would take um, Gibraltar back. And uh, one of the well, we'll sent a gunboat down. And actually, the Spanish Navy is far more sophisticated than the British Navy right now. And I think they'd win that one. We, we have um, a T-33 frigate is the last ship we, we, uh, we built, which we built in, uh, I think, 2002. And it's, it's to last 18 years. It's falling apart. We don't have any frigates anymore. The, the nuclear submarines uh, can no longer do three-month tours because they're all falling apart. It takes seven years to fix a nuclear submarine, so they have to do six-month tours. And the sailors are coming out barking, terrified, you know, appalled. We can't basically function. The Navy doesn't really work. Steve, I'm going to interrupt you. Well, OK. Because <laughs> in, in, in a past life, the, the, the story of Britain's military decline or the shrinking of its forces was a perennial, uh, often had to write editorials about it, always, almost always prompted by pleading, what you might call special pleading, on the part of the top brass. And completely understandable, you need to uh, defend your patch. And by my rough estimate, uh, the army is now a tenth of the size that it was in 1950, and the navy is a twentieth of the size that it was in, in 1940. And if you continue that graph, you get to nothing. So well, why do we need any of them? Why can't we just be a European Costa Rica? Well. This is, I mean, I think there's a very important question about what Britain thinks it is right, right. now. And I think that's really what we're discussing. Uh, Bronwyn Maddox, who um, is the director of Chatham House, uh, made a speech beautifully uh, timed on, I think, the same day, or if not the day before, um, Sir Patrick's Times, where she talked about Britain over-promising, Britain's sense of global Britain, this, this power that projects force. And I think that's really, really what we see our military is doing, is sort of playing with the Americans. I mean, sending two typhoons across 1,200 miles to drop a couple of bombs in Yemen when, why? And I think that's the, the question is, why are we doing these things? And I think it's to pretend that we're bigger than we are. And I think that there is a very good argument to say that it seems we've leached the natural resources out apart from the lithium in Cornwall, which you could come for, I suppose, and we do have quite a lot of gold. There's not a great deal to invade us for. <laughs> Returning to my theme uh, of the familiarity of this story, what makes it different now, arguably, is the Russian threat. But are we threatened? I mean, Estonia, yes. Lithuania, yes. Moldavia, yes. Obviously, Ukraine. But I mean, I think we, I, I mean, the idea that we're actually going to go to war with Russia? We're not big on honouring our treaties at the moment. I would say that is absolutely definitely the case. In recent history, we've tended to think it international law is bargainable and treaties are bargainable. Technically, we are in a treaty which says if one NATO country is yep. attacked, we go to fight the other NATO country. We've also previously never been in a situation where our naval ships have been rewired, so when they press to go forwards, they aren't going backwards and smack into oh, yeah. each other in, in port. So I think we've reached a pretty much a new low. This, that's my dad's army reference, in essence, is that we're... And now our ships are colliding because we don't really have to... So Has everyone we, we seen are obliged. Seen the footage? Do you want to describe it? Yes, yeah, so there was, there was a ship, HMS Chiddingford, which is a minesweeper, which had just been completely refitted, and it was imported in Bahrain as part of our force projection in the uh, Red Sea. And, and it was coming out on, led by two tugs, and the captain went, full, full ahead, push the lever down, and the ship went backwards, <laughs> and it backed into HMS Banger, which was in port next to it, ripped off the side of HMS Banger. And everyone said, well... OK, so that's not good, and um, that's currently how we're operating. But you know, essentially, if those countries are attacked, we have signed a piece of paper, as we did with plucky little Belgium, that we would, we would join in. Yeah. No, I, I, I take your point, that especially given what we were saying about the possibility of, of Trump too, that anything that undermines the sort of uh, strength of Article 5 guarantees is, uh, is, is pretty serious. Jane? 
Um, I'm really struck listening to Steve. I mean, you're right, obviously, if this Trump New World Order comes in, um, we're probably going to need more defence, let alone with the uh, war wars that are happening. I, I'm struck, though, we're, we're, I'm looking at an audience, there's quite a few young people, including my own teenage daughter, um, who's very interested in conscription. And everything we talk about with this, the sort of, you know, that some you know, army captain arguing for conscription and and spending more on defence because we've not spent anything since 1950 in the post-war. And it's the young, isn't it, who are going to be basically, it's, it's their future. Um, it's what happens to them. And I think the really sort of interesting thing about this, that this new world order that we seem to have slightly mocked up, um, you know, the post-war consensus that we had with Bretton Woods, with NATO, this is all, everything seems under threat at the moment. Now, do we need new frigates that can go forward, not backwards? Do we, um, or do we actually need new ways of thinking? And I think, to me, those, the arguments with this, you know, Giles is right, I feel as well, that we've heard these arguments. We need to be looking at what else can be done, which I know, you know, you're interested in as well, that whole, how do you use the sort of future and what say do they have? Because this is, I don't think it can be spending, given the dire strait of the economy as well. I, it, to me, it can't be the sort of first in line for the massive spending. But. I have a brief comeback on that. Go on. I mean, actually, one of the problems... That wasn't critical. No, no, this isn't critical. I mean, I'm... <laughs> I, I worked for Guardian for a very long time. <laughs> I don't like critical no, but, news meetings. I mean, there are many things, I, I think, there are many questions about the British military, many questions about um, conscription. One of, the, one of the things that the British military does do is I'm not quite like the Chinese army, but it, it acts to some degree as a recruitment and training if you overlay recruitment to the British military, it overlays very, very closely with areas of extremely high unemployment. So by and large, the people who join mm. are people who have no other options and who tend to, used to get trained in various... Mm. Um, I mean, these days, one of the, one of the guys saying to me, you can't have a conscript navy because it's incredibly hard to just work on a, on a battleship. They're incredibly sophisticated, computerised pieces of kit. You leave and you go straight into a reasonably good job. So it has this purpose, but also the manufacturing of these ships technically is something that we do. So we have these shipyards, which the only job they have left is to build frigates, but we don't give them any frigates to build. So there is a whole industrial strategy and a whole kind of employment strategy built around the idea that we do have and build boats, build, you know, re recruit soldiers, which keeps a significant number of people in certain kinds of work. And it, it, you know, it's, it's sort of the small, very, very tiny NHS in a way. Jess, you've been looking at this stuff as well. Is it your sense that the the steady decline in scale of British Armed Forces has actually reached a, a critical point now? Or is it, are we just on a, on a glide slope that we could report on in the same way before and in the future? Well, I think, this, I think it's a critical point now for the reasons that actually have already been mentioned, but I'll just repeat for emphasis. Is one is that it shows how worried senior people in the Armed Forces are about war with Russia, which, again, I don't think people are, are, are maybe being realistic enough about and that if if that happens if the war expands beyond ukraine it also shows how important ukraine is by the way which i think you know ukraine's fallen out the news cycle since gaza um in particular has happened but what ukrainian soldiers are doing at the moment matters so much more than we are still realized than we are realizing at the moment i think um and the other point is I think I, I read that downing street didn't want the speech today to be published because it raises this very uncomfortable truth that uh, if war with Russia does come, we're not prepared for it. And there's going to have to be a conversation in a, in a country where the NHS is buckling, where social security is buckling, where local councils are buckling. Do we want to give more money to the armed forces? And I don't, that's not the conversation I think they want to be having in the run-up to the general election. They want to be mm. giving away tax cuts and making everyone feel that it's OK. <laughs> um, mm. Where actually the more the more honest thing to do, but it, it probably won't happen in an election year, is to actually start having those those conversations right. about where where do we want to be spending our money? Especially in view of the fact that even though we are spending uh, more than two percent of GDP, unusually amongst non-US NATO members, it's still not nearly enough to be serious about building up an effective force. Also, we're doing it badly. I mean, we've, we've been spending on armoured vehicles for the last 25 years, but in that 25 years, we have not had a single armoured vehicle delivered. So we've spent on them, but they just they don't exist. So that's arguably... Poor. OK, so that is a story. That is definitely a story. <laughs> Where are the armoured vehicles? Yeah.
I mean, <laughs> it, it might have been done already, but I mean, is there the Bradleys, is that right? Uh, we, no, it's the Ajax program, Ajax. the Ajax platform, which is, there's some great ideas in, in building new military stuff. The Spanish have this ship which has an entirely virtual twin ship. Shit or ship? Ship. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a whole digital imaginary ship somewhere else. But the, the Ajax platform is, is, is like a, it's a, a vehicle that you can have into all sorts of different formats. And also, but there's some problem with the gun and also it makes sort of noise and it rattles. So each time they send us one, we go, well, this doesn't work and they send it back. So we don't actually have any of them. And that's a five, we spent a considerable amount of the 5.5 billion allotted to the program. And we don't have any yet. Line. And they're supposed to be delivered by now, but they're probably not coming until about 2029. <sighs> <laughs> Stephen, thank you. Let's take a moment and then we'll hear what Jane thinks should lead the news. Stephen, thank you for your story. Jane, what's yours? Yeah, no, I'll, do, I'll explain that. That's like, a, that's like an I audio... I was literally trying to go, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> trying to create a blank space on your tape. Ad break. <laughs> Let's do that again. <laughs> Stephen, thank you for your story. Let's take a moment and then we'll hear what Jane thinks should lead the news. Stephen, thank you. Jane, what's yours? Thanks, Giles. Um, all this talk about, um, you know, war that's going on and um, tensions overseas, I would like to pitch a story about what or who is the Conservative Britain Alliance. Um, I've only recently become aware of this grouping because of this astonishing campaign. Um, essentially, you said something about Trump, which was don't make assumptions, make proposals. Well, amazingly, this Conservative Britain Alliance seems to be making a proposal in Britain, which is to get rid of the leader of the Conservative Party or the Prime Minister, just ahead of going to the polls. Now, it isn't unusual for Conservatives to get rid of a leader without going to an election, obviously, as we all know, <laughs> over the last few years. But it does seem the most incredible campaign, and I really think it warrants um, a lot more coverage and a lot more understanding, because we are talking about um, not only the Prime Minister, but a really powerful group of people, not just in Westminster, but also using the media, um, what we used to call Fleet Street. So I was struck today, and for uh, listeners at home, um, I will say what the audience can see, which is that I've actually got a paper copy of the Daily Telegraph today, because yet again, they paper. have, <laughs> they have um, put on the top of the front page a story by um, Sir Simon Clarke, who used to be number two to Rishi Sunak at uh, the Treasury, is, you know, says he's quite a nice chap, but says he's a complete disaster because he is not doing what, and he calls the people that really want cons core conservative values, which if you read his very long piece, he's given most a sort of broadsheet page six, a um, very long piece is basically he's not tough enough on immigration. He's allowing people to arrive illegally. Um, this comes after, so the Telegraph is really interesting for lots of reasons as part of this. Um, but this comes after the Telegraph on the middle of, it was middle of, uh, it was a Sunday, the 14th of January. Um, they ran with this poll. They had a specially commissioned poll. Um, which splashed that um, it was going to be extinction for the Tories. They had, you know, the Conservative Party had to do something about it because of the combination of um, you know, the red wall was going to fall, the blue wall was, was going to vote for possibly not the Liberal Democrats, but somebody else. It was going to be a complete disaster because, again, because the Conservatives are just not right wing enough. This was in order to stop that Rwanda uh, bill. It failed to do that, but their campaign hasn't stopped. And it's got this sort of incredible collection of people. Um, so whether it's sort of Richard Tice and the Reform Party, who's obviously with and Nigel Farage, who has not declared, or, or if anything, he will do. Um, you've got people within the party, obviously, who are very unhappy with Rishi Sunak. Interestingly enough, there is no obvious candidate. And there's a wonderful line at the end of this front story which says, the poll, and this is where we get the, it's this sort of final paragraph of this story, the poll, the YouGov poll that says the Tories will be wiped out um, unless they choose a new leader with core Conservative values, was commissioned by a group of Conservative donors called Conservative Britain Alliance. 
they did not present respondents with the names of possible alternative Tory leaders. So they don't even have anyone after all these sort of different people. Nobody is willing. So apparently Kemi Badenoch, um, who does apparently have core conservative values, doesn't want to stand because it's looking all a bit grim at the moment and the party is going through one of its it used to be sort of infrequent and is now pretty regular fights and sort of battles for the heart of Britain. Coming back to the Daily Telegraph, which, as uh, as you know, is, is one of the things I've written lots about. The last podcast I did was about the Telegraph, the battle for the Telegraph, because the Barclays owned the Telegraph. Um, they've sort of are still owners, although in, as part of a, a sort of very interesting debt swap, they're going to... They've already agreed to sell it to a group um, which is effectively um, paid for and 75% backed by uh, Sheikh Manzoor of um, Jane, Derby. I'm going to ask you to choose between you are which story to... you're pitching. No, um, I think the who or what is the Conservative Britain okay, Alliance. Good. That's very simple, Giles. I think... <laughs> <laughs> because what's so interesting is that there's this incredible news which is really front and centre of... I mean... The Daily Tory Girl, as it used to be called, the most Conservative Party backing paper, the House Bible of the Conservative Party, um, is now not only splashing massive polls that say get rid of Rishi Sunak, it's basically running these pieces by his former allies and friends who are now saying get rid of Rishi Sunak. They mention this... I mean, I'm not being overly journalistic to call it a shadowy organisation. What is Conservative? Does anyone here know Conservative Britain Alliance? So I want to know who are the donors. So there is, you know, the names that are often mentioned. Obviously, Paul Marshall, who has a big stake in GB News and also has Unheard, has made it very, very, very clear that he is very keen to buy the Telegraph as well. Um, and we know he's a donor to the CBA. Well, we know that he has been supportive of um, the sort of an alt-right right, voice. Right, right. So in terms of who the alliance are, that's what I'm saying, that's why we need to make it, give it more oxygen, because I think it is, it's really interesting who, who is on it. Peter Grudders is also um, mentioned as a major donor. Every sort of hedge fund, um, anyone with any money that believes in things like stopping boats, immigration going too far. Um, they seem to be quite keen on this organisation, the involvement of GB News. Interestingly, on Friday, and I know this goes out on Friday, the 26th of January, that's when Ofcom, the media regulator, will decide whether or not the ownership of the Telegraph, uh, this bid by um, Abu Dhabi, which lots and lots of conservative voices, not just these sort of um, overtly political ones, but people like Charles Moore, a uh, big friend of Boris Johnson and former uh, editor of Daily Sunday Telegraph and The Spectator, very opposed to nation state control by Abu Dhabi, but also, you know, Michael Heseltine, William Waldrove. On the other side, on the side that says you should buy them, is Nadim Zahawi, George Osborne acting for, for Redbird. I just think this is like a battle. It, and it's not whether you're a sort of Conservative Party member or voter or not. This is incredible. This is a government where the party seems in this incredible, like it is this sort of rebel alliance. It seems like some sort of, you know, fight for the soul of what it really is and whether it is right wing enough. And that's going to change our politics and the, the politics of this country um, even more. You know, 2016, obviously, it's been changing quite a lot. And um, even if they're in the political wilderness for the next patch. I, yeah. So it, it's a, it's certainly a, a great question, uh, who and what are, is, is the alliance. Can we park that for a second and um, uh, park Sir Simon Clarke, the author of this piece, his views on immigration? I read his piece very nicely written, good, slick read, isn't at the core of it a completely unassailable argument. He's absolutely dead right that they're sleepwalking to electoral disaster under this leader, so they might as well change the leader. I, it's really interesting, though, that they're using this YouGov poll that is not... I mean, the YouGov itself has had to come forward and say that the way they've been reading it is not quite as um, catastrophic. All the okay, polls suggest... You're YouGov. absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. All the polls suggest, though, that um, the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, are going to win. Um, it doesn't seem like it's quite as... I mean, these, these 
do seem, you don't get anywhere that's quite as sort of stark. And if you do this, this will happen. If you do that, it won't. Um, and it, it does, you're right, if you were to put money on it, you wouldn't put money on the Conservative Party within, which is why they're slightly struggling to find a new leader. Um, <laughs> but, but what that means in terms of the Reform Party, I mean, that's, you know, Richard Tice um, and people that back the Reform Party, does that mean that actually the politics, if there is a, a Labour government, uh, you know, that he, again, his piece, which was really interesting, which says, you know, we could have the horror of a Labour government for the next 10 years. Mm. Um, but actually, isn't it more a call to arms to have those who believe the Conservative Party has lost its way because it's just become a bit too not really clear on, you know, red and teeth and claw Conservative issues? as a new far-right party, the sort of, I mean, with the sort of Trump-like figure, with all the, it's the populace. And they even, um, I was I heard something um, earlier today about how Rishi Sunak has some incredibly populist policies, but he's not a very convincing populist. Mm -hmm. um, so people don't really, because of the way he is and his sort of, you know, his background, they think, oh, he doesn't really believe it. Whereas um, similar background in some ways, in terms of private schooling and work to, Nigel Farage, but people believe Nigel Farage because he drinks beer in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, anyway. So, Jane, I see uh, three strands to this, and I'll, I'll accept that they're, they're intimately in, interwoven. The battle for the soul of the Tory party looking forward, battle for the soul of the Daily Telegraph as the voice of looking forward, but also an immediate battle for control of uh, Downing Street right now, because that's what uh, Simon Clark is is arguing for in his piece. Um, uh, Jess, as news editor, uh, which of those components is grabbiest to you, if any? <laughs> or you can just trash the whole story. No, I don't want to trash the whole story because I think I'm, I started thinking of it in the terms of a slow newscast, the kind of investigative podcast that Tortoise does, because that's all about a narrative and taking something quite complicated and trying to unpick it. And there's, I was just, I was trying to keep up with it and just, there's a lot to unpick there. And as you say, all the, yeah, the sale, the right wing, sort of what's going on in the right wing press, what's going on in the right wing side of the conservatives um, and the battle for control of Downing Street. I think uh, at the moment, the most immediate one that I'd commission is the one looking at the Telegraph, given that the Ofcom deadline on Friday's is tomorrow. Deadline. Or, or, sorry, yes, it's on Friday. Uh, although we might not know what that is straight away, and then why why they are why they seem to be taking this battle to the Conservative Party when they need the Conservative Party on side to maybe fend off a Redbird takeover, I think is a really important one to unpick. I'm not. I think we need to find a little bit more about the alliance and actually find a character to bring that all to life to kind of help you navigate through all of those threads. And Paul Marshall, that's why Paul Marshall is interesting in this. Mm. Um, I mean, he's not come forward and said he doesn't tend to give or he hasn't given interviews um, since he sort of started off his own uh, media organisations quite so much. But he, um, it, that sort of link between, he has made no secret of wanting to own the Telegraph um, and sort of believing in having sort of radical views. So it is interesting. But there are other, you know, obviously, it is an alliance. Yeah. So it's. I have to declare I used to work for the Telegraph. I feel I should just put that out there <laughs> because this is all getting a little bit close to home. Steve, do you like this story? I. I mean, I think. What do you think the story is? I think the story, ultimately, these stories, actually, the, the story about Trump and this boiled down to the same basic question about politics, which is, can you win on your base or not? And I think this is where the this is what's happening at the Conservative party is trying to work out how to appeal to a particular base. And it's not sure what its base is at the moment. It, so it, it won the election by appealing to a sort of pro-Brexit idea, which it thought was its new base. And I think there's an argument to say that's that was mistaken st strategy, because I think there are a lot of people, particularly in going back to my story, the army, um, in uh, Red Wall cities who were repelled by Jeremy Corbyn. There were a lot of families there, for instance, who had never voted for Corbyn because he supported the IRA. I think there was a lot of people who were rejected into that vote as much as were attracted into that vote. Um, and I think that there's, there's, there's an issue to some degree with actually the Conservative Party losing its blue wall because there's a lot of people who are repelled by the, by the kind of 
right? The, the, the Paul Marshall style of conservatism. I also think there's a link between that particular group of conservatives, the, the conferences they hold, and the American right. This, the, there, there's far more collusion, conversation, and collaboration between these factions in America and the UK on the right than there are on the left. So I think these things wrap together to the degree that I think it's almost impossible to run as a single story. I think what it is, is it sets you up with a series of questions in an election year which demand us to investigate and understand what's going on. Because I think, I think that is, uh, I hate this phrase, it is a canary in a coal mine, that cry. It's so clearly preposterous a suggestion. I mean, it's so obviously insane. So much so that David Davis said, the cabal on the right are getting silly. David Davis <laughs> said the cabal on the right are getting silly. And Pretty Patel described it as a facile and divisive self-indulgence. <laughs> So that's, it's obviously insane, but it must, so therefore it can't exist in and of itself. It must symptomise, it must be a symptom of something. But that's, again, going back to the Trump model. It, it, the problem has been, hasn't it, that it's sort of easy to dismiss these uh, people as a sort of lunatic fringe. And actually, you talk about conservative base and any of the, the Labour Party base, our politics have changed so much since 2016. The world's politics has actually changed. That that idea of base, that's why it's this massive battle, isn't it? Whether it's Trump or whether it's here, that this sort of, um, it's not the lunatic fringe anymore, if it ever were. It's absolutely being sort of dragged in. Yeah, but they're not lunatics, that's the yeah, point. They're exactly. Not, they're, the, what, the, reason, the reason Trump is still such a formidable candidate, the reason he is still getting so many people to vote for him is that he recognised very early on that people are worried about migration and that no one's really got f through, th you know, th a coherent policy on how to effectively manage it. And that needs a much more grown up conversation about, OK, we know that more people are going to be moving over the coming years. How do we manage this well? So it's even no one wants to have that conversation. But Trump recognised the concern about it and capitalised on that. Although the irony, of course, is he recognises it and then his response to this sort of lack of a grown-up debate is to physically build a wall that doesn't actually work. I mean, that's sort of... That's... Yeah, but that you can... It, it, he make, it's very... It's, you can laugh at him and I you know. can dismiss him, but I'm just... This is part of the kind of waking up to it. It's yeah. like people... The, these, mm -hmm. not these, this is, these aren't crazy ideas to be worried about migration, to feel that you have no chance of improving your life to the same degree that your parents were able to. That applies in the UK and Britain. He's, he's feeding off that. And they're, they're relevant concerns. So I think it's a question of being able to, to counter those mm. without needing someone like Trump. Thank you all very much. Those are the stories. There are, of course, many others out there in the world, but those are the ones that we are um, discussing in a moment. I will decide which should lead the news. But before I do that, I want to know from you guys which you would choose, and you can't choose your own. So who's going to go first? Jane, you cannot choose the Sir Simon Clark story. I actually like both the other stories, Richard. You do have to choose one. OK. Well, I suppose I would go because the need to, like, just because it's happened is the New Hampshire vote. Um, because, uh, as Jess said, we have been saying, oh, Trump, 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 but because of what we see in the courts, because you can't believe that anyone with that many criminal cases could possibly come back to stand the election and win, uh, it seems to me a real moment, and it's a sort of astonishing moment that even though I preface this by talking about the oxygen to Trump, you have to talk about why it's happening and that it has happened. Steve? I, I'm fascinated by the threads that go into Jane's. I think it's a, it's a really complicated story and I think it's difficult to say it should run in and of itself at the top of the hour or whatever mm -hmm. because I think it requires unpicking. I don't quite know what the headline of it is, but I think it's the one that I'm most fascinated by finding out where it goes. OK. Jess? I'm going to go for the armed forces. Aww. So we each get one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what good collaborative news is yeah. like. <laughs> well, you'll, you'll know help at all. OK, so, uh, I mean, collectively, you definitely need to decide. Um, so I've been having a bit of a grump internally recently about he said stories, or she said stories, or they said stories, uh, which feel to me less substantive than someone did something stories. And currently, when we've got two real hot wars happening, someone said something stories always seem less important, less deserving of the top slot than who's still alive 
who's attacking who stories, grim as they are to report. And in a sense, um, so Simon Clark saying, let's ditch uh, Sunak is a he said story. In a sense, uh, the top brass saying we're running out of armed forces is a familiar they said story. So my instinct at first is to look, as you did, at New Hampshire and ask myself, so what's the surprise? And the trouble is, there's no real surprise in the result. I do take your argument that it's a reality check for those who have been clinging on to reasons to believe that Trump might not be the candidate. You, you, you heard it here, he, he's gonna be the candidate. Um, uh, but for me, that's not enough to put at the top. So I come back to the two someone said uh, stories. And of those, I'm going to side with Sir Simon Clark, who is the Conservative Britain Alliance, who's going to win the battle for the soul of the Tory party and of the Telegraph. Uh, because it's already written into British political history. Uh, it will have an immediate sequel on, on Friday, if that's when we know who the, uh, an immediate follow-up, if that's when we know who the uh, owner of the Telegraph is going to be. But simply by virtue of inserting himself in such forthright language into the discussion, uh, I think he grabbed himself the top spot this time. Uh, Sir Simon Clark did, and so did you, Jane Martinson. Many <laughs> congratulations. It just shows the power of words. Right, so that's how I'd run the stories. Remember, you can email us about the stories you think we've missed. Heaven knows there are plenty of them. Just send your thoughts to newsmeeting at tortoisemedia.com. And at this point, I can read an email that came to us from Finn after Monday's episode. And Finn said, just a quick one to express my unspeakable relief that you went for the MMR story today to lead the news. If we've learned anything from the COVID era, it is that epidemiological matters need to be understood better. And in order for that, they need to be reported better by journals such as yourselves. I didn't actually know about this story, he says, before listening to you. And all the points raised were solid, salient, and most importantly, cogent. This affects me personally as my school-aged children are still unvaccinated and I am in a pre-legal process against their mother, very much Wakefield-inspired, that's Andrew Wakefield, the propagator of the myth that there is a link between MMR and uh, autism. I shall start that sentence again so you can... And I am in a pre-legal process against their mother, very much Wakefield-inspired, to try to change that. So... Now, given that we're joined by people in the newsroom, let's see what you think we should be covering. So, yes, Paul. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think Moab should be leading absolutely every news story everywhere. The mother of all breaches. This is 26 billion personal records that have been discovered. Mother of all breaches? I thought you were talking about a place in Utah. But <laughs> no, this is personal information breaches that have happened across Tencent, TikTok, Twitter, have all been compiled into one data source that was discovered in the last 24, 30 hours. Uh, Who's reporting this? Where? Computer, Computer Weekly, all the usual IT trades. If you okay. have a good... Uh, security on your computer, they'll have emailed you and told you to check in. <laughs> I won't say the name of the brand that I use. Because... <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and the IT sector are basically saying this is probably the biggest, um, largest and most impactful data breach that's ever been discovered and is probably going to be the most seismic impact on personal data. Okay, impactful. Do, do we know how? Is it going to take our money? Um, at the moment, they've not discovered any banking details, but because a lot of people use the same passwords they use on their social media as they do on, on everything else, a lot of these records have been cross-referenced. 
um, which will allow people to basically pinpoint exactly who you are, where you are, what you're doing, and then emulate your behavior to be able to get into other records. And it's a dump. My, my date of birth and my home address. You knew about this? I've just had the email today from my, uh, they said, do you want to check? I checked. So they have my name, my date of birth, my home address, the IP address of my computer, and a number of my passwords. Blimey, Paul, thank you. You're making me feel very silly. We'll definitely, <laughs> we'll definitely have to run this tomorrow morning. Um, anyone else? Any other stories that, that we've missed? Is everybody comfortable with the fact that we have not discussed Israel Gaza this evening? There's no actual nodding of heads, <laughs> but, uh, but there's, a nod, there's a slight nod over there, yes. Lady with the white hair. Well, is there anything new to say? Good point. I mean, you could argue, as we did yesterday, that uh, having basically ruled out support for any form of uh, independent Palestinian state, clear blue water has opened up between Israel and its closest allies, the US and the UK, and that... Uh, but I would, I would accept the argument that perhaps was yesterday's story. And had been signaled beforehand anyway. Yeah. Can I put forward a positive news story? Yes. To, yes. We've, this is the week that the first mass malaria vaccine was rolled out. That's a pretty big deal. That's a happening that started this week in Cameroon. After one, the first of two vaccines that have now been approved by the World Health Organization are now being rolled out to... Um, uh, I want to say 20 million children, but I want to double check that number. But this is the first time that has happened at this scale. And I think that's something to be happy about. Yeah, great story, great science story, great public health story. And interestingly, it's Cameroon. Mm. It's not that long ago that we were writing stories about the risk of full on civil war there. And we've talked a lot about US, UK without mentioning the tea wars that have happened today. Did the you see tea that? wars? Yeah. No. A US professor was suggesting how to make the perfect cup of tea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is guaranteed to cause problems. But their solution was to put a little bit of salt in it, apparently. Oh, they it, like something over the side of the ship. It, so removes, it removes some of the bitterness. This is what happens yes. when you get Americans I know. of any kind. I will not I tolerate reflective anti-Americanism on this show. <laughs> <laughs> um, making but tea, I, only making tea. Fair enough. I mean, let's start with boiling water, right? <laughs> Stephen, Jess and Jane, thank you. If you want to hear more from Jane, you can listen to Mr. Wright, Paul Marshall and the Battle for the Telegraph by searching for the Slow Newscast wherever you get your podcast. You can also read her new book, which I will repeat is called You May Never See Us Again, The Definitive Story. No, no. I'll, I'll do that again because the sort of the, the subtitle peters out into our guff. You're going so well. Yeah. <laughs> you can also read her new book, You May Never See Us Again, which is the definitive story of the Telegraph owners, David and Frederick Barclay. That's it for this episode of The News Meeting. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review it wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back on Monday. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>